Hondurans mark 10 years since the coup with more protests against the government. Caribbean countries join a protest at the OAS against the presence of a Venezuelan opposition delegate. And President Putin calls on BRICS countries to set aside the U.S. dollar and trade in their own currencies. Hello and welcome to Telesur. I'm Carla Gonzalez from Quito and this is from the South. Venezuela's President Nicolás Maduro has pledged to continue the frozen dialogue with the opposition in Norway despite alleged assassination attempts against him. Yo prefiero entonces callar. I prefer to keep quiet because in these cases I want to advance the dialogue with the Norwegians if it's going to continue and we're going to advance with verifiable agreements for the sake of peace in Venezuela. After an investigation lasting more than a year, the government of Venezuela says it has prevented another attempted coup. A number of civilians and former military officers have been arrested in connection with the plot. More in this report. Attacks on military bases like this one were part of the plan to carry out another coup in Venezuela. They also planned to steal weapons and to murder generals and government leaders. President Maduro confirmed the plot. The complicity of Ivan Duque and the Colombian government is clear. They played an active part in this fascist attempt to kill me and mount terrorist attacks with bombs to kill social movement leaders in Venezuela. Where else could this murderous plan come from but from the Colombian oligarchy, from Ivan Duque and Álvaro Uribe, the killers of Colombia? And the world should know that from Colombia there is a conspiracy to subvert the peace and unity of Venezuela. We will not tolerate this. The people from abroad in collaboration with the North Americans and the Israelis. The authorities presented 56 hours of recordings as evidence. Lo que no sabía Duque, lo que no sabía Piñera. What Duque, Piñera, and Guaidó didn't know was that our intelligence services had been tracking all these operations for 14 months. A todas estas operaciones. Opposition figures are seen and heard preparing attacks, but they also seem to be divided. Car de las de el Sevin. They were going to free Raúl Baduel from his jail at Sevin, take him to the Carlota base, then take him to the public TV channel, and from there declare Raúl Baduel president of Venezuela, a second self-proclaimed president in less than six months. So I wonder, did they consult Guaidó, or was it to be a coup by Baduel against Guaidó and against President Maduro? That is how things stand in the ranks of Venezuela's far right. Un golpe militar. The former general Raúl Baduel is in prison for corruption. While the self-proclaimed leader Juan Guaidó dismissed the government's accusation linking him to this new coup attempt, political observers say Guaidó's reaction is an attempt to minimize the accusations of corruption against members of his inner circle for stealing humanitarian aid in Colombia. A case has been opened against 14 civilians and former military officers for their part in this latest attempt to take power by force. The Attorney General is accusing them of conspiracy and terrorism. Uruguay has led a walkout from the General Assembly of the Organization of American States in protest at the seating of a delegation claiming to represent Venezuela. At the first plenary session of the Assembly, the Uruguayan ambassador objected to the presence of a representative of the opposition figure, Juan Guaidó, along with a large delegation. Uruguay pointed out that Venezuela had already left the OAS. The walkout was joined by Mexico, Bolivia and Nicaragua, and several Caribbean countries also spoke out against the presence of the Guaidó delegation. Antigua and Barbuda's foreign affairs minister told the assembly's plenary session that the OAS needs urgent reforms. He says it as, as it stands, a few powerful countries coerce 18 votes in a non-transparent way and then impose their will on all. The foreign minister says the OAS is now being regarded as a punitive organization, not a healing one, 
It is becoming an organization that pours oil on troubled water. If this broken system and disregard for consensus building continues, if a crippled OAS limps along as a house divided against itself, it will collapse and something might emerge in its place. Our correspondent, Paola, Paola Fernandez, has more from the OAS meeting in Colombia. Here in Colombia, the OAS General Assembly is taking place where several countries expressed their rejection of the presence of a delegate of Venezuela's opposition leader, Juan Guaido. For example, Uruguay left the opening event and other countries followed, like Bolivia, who said that Venezuela had already left the OAS and that's why it shouldn't be a central topic. They said that accepting a delegate could mean recognition by the OAS of Juan Guaido as president. Also joining the call were Nicaragua, Mexico, Grenada, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Trinidad and Tobago, Antigua and Barbuda, Suriname and Dominica. There have also been several protests to denounce the humanitarian crisis in Colombia, which hasn't been discussed at this meeting. Paula Fernandez from Medellin. And it's exactly 10 years since the coup in Honduras, and the country is still submerged in violence, poverty, and insecurity, the root causes of forced migration, and the latest wave of protest against the government. Our correspondent Gilda Silvestrucci reports from Tegucigalpa. On the streets, violence and repression is the same as those days before the coup in 2009. Militarization and criminalization of the protesters hasn't stopped. We've left behind blood and sweat on the road. We've lost our comrades, our brothers who have fought. For us, it's a struggle. We have to follow through so we can be free from this dictatorship. And we are also fighting for our children, for our grandchildren. Nearly 70% of Honduras' population lives in poverty. Over the past decade, current government authorities who were part of the coup have created this grim reality. The country has also seen a worsening of corruption. A reconstruirse. Ten years ago, our country began to rebuild a model of accumulation of wealth with new forms of entrepreneurship linked to organized crime, drug trafficking, and giving privileges to transnational companies in the country. Privatizations and concessions of territory, of mining and hydroelectric plants were carried out immediately after the 2009 coup. It's been a process of depending neoliberalism, social contradictions for the past decade. We are in a highly sensitive moment for the country. The change of government following the ousting of former President José Manuel Zelaya Rosales wasn't an answer to Honduras' problems. In fact, it was the beginning of a grave crisis. First, we need to change this government. It's a failure. They've had 10 years and they're even worse. Second, we need to change the figures who dominate the society, beginning with the political class and their stance towards the United States. Murders, criminalization, prosecution and exile and military power consolidated to the political power. It all happened after the coup in 2009. Statistics from the human rights organizations reveal that more than 700 people were murdered during the coup. Their relatives are still seeking justice. Those responsible for the coup haven't faced trial, and the murders of hundreds of people remain unpunished. It all remains the same, because the public ministry and the Supreme Court have kept hearing the reports. For example, for my daughter, Isi, obeyed even the ballistic report. The public ministry has taken little action to bring the requirement of the cases to the prosecutors. José Manuel Zelaya was accused of promoting a referendum to approve his re-election, but in fact, the current president, Juan Orlando Hernández, was the one who violated the Constitution while being supported by powerful groups, the Supreme Court and the armed forces. After the break in the U.S., the presidential hopefuls for the Democratic Party start a brawl over race. Don't go away.
actions have an impact on the environment. It's our responsibility to change for the sake of our planet. Let's be part of this transition. Watch, preserve and protect your green zone. Wednesday, only on Telesur. for joining us again. More news at Telesur. There was heated exchange over race at the second U.S. Democratic debate. California Senator Kamala Harris attacked former Vice President Joe Biden for once working with segregationist senators to oppose busing. Biden, at a campaign event earlier this month, had cited his ability to get things done, even with segregationists. Harris, whose parents are immigrants from Jamaica and India, questioned Biden's opposition to school busing in the 1970s. Busing was used as a means of alleviating racial segregation by transporting students to schools within or outside their local districts. Um, I do not believe you are a racist. And I agree with you when you commit yourself to the importance of finding common ground. But I also believe, and it is personal, and I was actually very, it was hurtful to hear you talk about the reputations of two United States senators who built their reputations and career on the segregation of race in this country. And it was not only that, but you also worked with them to oppose busing. And, you know, there was a little girl in California who was part of the second class to integrate her public schools. And she was bused to school every day. And that little girl was me. So I will tell you that on this subject, it cannot be an intellectual debate among Democrats. We have to take it seriously. We have to act swiftly. It's a mischaracterization of my position across the board. I did not praise racist. That is not true, number one. Number two, if we want to have this campaign litigated on who supports civil rights and whether I did or not, I'm happy to do that. I was a public defender. I didn't become a prosecutor. I came out and I left a good law firm to become a public defender when in fact, when in fact, when in fact my city was in flames because of the, the uh, assassination of Dr. King. I did not oppose busing in America. What I opposed is busing ordered by the Department of Education. That's what I oppose. Well, I there did was not a oppose. failure of, of states to, to integrate no, public schools in America. I was part of the second the, class to integrate Berkeley, but, California public schools almost two decades after Brown v. Board of Education. Because your city council made that decision. It was a so local decision. So that's where the federal government must step now, in. That's why we have the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. That's why we need to pass the Equality Act. That's why we need to pass the ERA, because that's there right. are moments in history where states fail to preserve the civil rights of I all people. I have supported the okay, ERA okay. from the very beginning. During Thursday evening's debate, presidential contender Bernie Sanders held a little back as he trained his sights on President Donald Trump. The American people understand that Trump is a phony, that Trump is a pathological liar and a racist, and that he lied to the American people during his campaign. He said he was going to stand up for working families. Well, President Trump, you're not standing up for working families when you try to throw 32 million people off the health care that they have, and that 83% of your tax benefits go to the top 1%. That's how we beat Trump. We expose him for the fraud that he is. The U.S. House of Representatives has passed the Senate version of the $4.6 billion bill to send emergency funding to the Mexican border. The measure, which has passed 305 to 102, will next go to the White House for the president's signature. House Democrats had originally wanted to pass a stricter bill with extra protections for migrant children, 
but the Senate voted it down. The aid plan comes amid outrage over U.S. detention conditions and an image showing a drowned father and daughter trying to reach the U.S. Democratic leader. In South Africa, following the State of the Nation address by President Cyril Ramaphosa, an important trade agreement was signed between Chinese and South African business entrepreneurs. Give a big round of applause. During the special ceremony in Cape Town, 93 economic and trade cooperation agreements were signed. Ladies and gentlemen, you may sign your documents. Minister of Trade and Industry, Ibrahim Patel, said that the deals worth in excess of 27 billion rand will help create jobs for young people, deepen South Africa's industrial footprint and grow the country's gross domestic product. We also offer a very profitable place from which to do business. South In Africa addressing the delegation, Patel describes South Africa as the gateway to reaching more than a billion consumers in Africa. Where a Chinese company partners with a South African company and manufactures here in South Africa, a great opportunity is presented to export duty-free into the rest of the African continent, into the European Union and into the United States through our favorable trade agreements. The high-level Chinese delegation was led by Chinese Assistant Minister of Again, Commerce, Ren Hongbin. This trade promotion delegation is made of more than 80 Chinese entrepreneurs from nearly 40 large-scale key enterprises in sectors, including agriculture, light industry, textile, medicine, chemistry, and minerals. Chinese ambassador to South Africa, Lin Songtian, describes South African and Chinese cooperation as entering a new era. China and South African relations has, have entered the golden time of harvest. International Relations and Cooperation Minister Naledi Pando and the Minister of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development, Toko Didiza, also attended the signing ceremony. Johan Abrams for Telesur in Cape Town. At the G20 summit in Japan, Russian President Vladimir Putin has called on the BRICS countries to boost international payments in national currencies and leave aside the U.S. dollar. The president was addressing leaders from Brazil, India, China and South Africa on the sidelines of the main G20 meeting in the city of Osaka. The five BRICS nations represent 40% of the world's population and almost a quarter of global GDP. Putin said they had a duty to seek a more stable international economy. It is symptomatic that international trade is losing its role as the economic growth locomotive and bearing a heavy burden of protectionism, politically motivated restrictions and barriers. We see low business activity, world debt growth, high volatility on financial, currency and raw materials markets. Under these circumstances, BRICS states should take the initiative in the formation of a more just and stable model of global development, based on the principles of equality, respect to sovereignty, and consideration of all countries' interests. And as world leaders arrived in Osaka, the trade war between the United States and China was expected to overshadow the two-day summit. And the nuclear deal with Iran was also expected to be high on the agenda. U.S. President Donald Trump has already met with Vladimir Putin and he's expected to meet Xi Jinping on Saturday. The organization of the petroleum exporting countries is expected to roll over a deal on cutting supplies at a meeting next week in Austria's capital, Vienna. In an exclusive interview for the Venezuelan Ministry of Petroleum, OPEC Secretary General Mohamed Barquindo said that sanctions on Venezuela and Iran affect all the OPEC nations. In addition, we have other geopolitical tensions, in particular in the Middle East, in Iran, in Venezuela, as a result of these punitive sanctions mm -hmm. that are imposed on these major producers and exporters of oil. Now, for us in OPEC, sanctions on two founding members of our organizations, major suppliers of oil to the international market, 
This sanction is on all of us. Barquindo has also praised Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro for his strong leadership, especially under the current challenges his country is facing. Uh, we have seen continuous strong leadership being uh, provided by President uh, Nicolás Maduro during these uh, challenging times. And as you know, this year Venezuela currently holds the presidency of the OPEC conference, uh, which is very able uh, minister, uh, Minister Mani Quevedo, uh, is, uh, is, is deputizing uh, for President uh, Maduro. And one of the big issues behind both the coming OPEC meeting and the G20 summit is the mounting tension between Iran and the United States. We ask Telesur's political analyst Tariq Ali to explain this escalation. The big demand of the Israelis has been to bomb the nuclear reactors like they did in Iraq uh, some decades ago. The Israelis carried out those attacks, uh, and the United States still recently has been resisting any unilateral Israeli action. And I think that is why the Trump government upped the pressure on Tehran, but they have a huge problem. There were people like uh, uh, John Bolton and other rogue state luminaries in the State Department, and uh, not to mention Pompeo himself, are carrying out this uh, campaign. It appears to be the case that the Pentagon is opposed to any foolish, irrational war in Iran for the time being. So they were thinking of a token bombing in response to Iran bringing down a, 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 a U.S. drone in its territorial waters. They thought a short, sharp response would be necessary. They almost got it through the Pompeo-Bolton faction, and at the last minute, Trump pulled the plug and said, no, don't do it. Why did he do that? I think because there was opposition in the Pentagon. Otherwise, the whole uh, thing had been agreed. And the pressure really comes uh, uh, from the Israelis, who do not want any sovereign state in the Middle East. That was Tariq Ali speaking on the U.S.-Iran issue. Coming up, the heat wave in Spain kills two and wildfires continue to burn. Stay with us. Who's moving the chess? What interests motivate the actors behind the event? Se despliega el tablero. On critical moves, investigates every event from Monday to Friday. Only on the resort. Today's stories. Europe is facing an intense heat wave. And for more on that, we have our correspondent in Spain, Eduardo Marín, with more. At least two people have died in Spain due to the heat wave that is hitting the country in the past days. On Thursday, a man in his 80s died after collapsing on the street. Emergency services couldn't help him. And today, Friday, a young man, only 17 years old, has died after working for several hours in an open field. He tried to freshen up by throwing himself in a pool, and due to that harsh change of temperature, he entered into a coma. At least two more people are being treated in the hospital due to the consequences of this heat wave. We are expecting to get 44 degrees Celsius in the hottest place in the country. Oh, 
Now we go to sports. Today's Cricket World Cup match is turning out to be quite a stinger. A swarm of bees invaded the playing surface, temporarily suspending play between Sri Lanka and South Africa. Midway through Sri Lanka's innings, as the flying troublemakers made their way onto the square, forcing batsmen, bowlers and umpires to dive, take cover and hit the deck. A stressful game indeed, that cricket. Anyway, inset invasion aside, play resumed, with South Africa bowling out Sri Lanka for just 203. The Sri Lankans just kept on losing wickets at regular intervals. Sri Lanka now need to defend a target of 204 runs if they want to stay alive in this World Cup. West Indies cricketing great Sir Everton Weeks is in intensive care after suffering a heart attack in Barbados. The 94-year-old is being treated at Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Bridgetown. The Barbadian remains the only man to record centuries in five consecutive test innings, a feat achieved in 1949. Weeks is known as one of the famous three W's of the West Indies, alongside Frank Worrell and Clyde Walcott. Earlier this week, another cricket legend, Brian Lara, was hospitalized in India after suffering chest pains. Lara has since been released. And finally, a new dinosaur species has been discovered in the Brazilian state of Paraná. Fossils of the new species named Vespersaurus paranaensis indicate that it lived some 90 million years ago in northwestern Brazil, which at the time was a desert. The dinosaur was carnivorous and reached about a meter and a half in length. São fragmentos de ossos de um novo dinossauro. And with that, we end our news brief, but you can find all of our stories by checking our website, telesurenglish.net. For our viewers in Africa, remember you can find us on Starsat Channel 461 in South Africa and 539 in Nigeria. And you can also join us on social media.